King. Good evening. It's a bit difficult to tell you what you should be doing because this is as atypical as <laughs> you can imagine. Sixties every day. Uh, it's just hard to know exactly what's going to happen and uh, what you should be doing. But so I'm going to go just with straight, regular recommendations. I assume we're going to get some cold spells, um, and the bees, if, when it turns cold, are going to shut down or certainly turn back somewhat of what they're currently uh, doing. If we talk, talk about spring management, there are really three major objectives to spring management. First of all, development of strong productive hives. Secondly, swarm prevention and thirdly, swarm control. But we're only going to talk about the first one tonight because it's too early for swarm prevention and uh, swarm control. However, if we continue these 60, day, 60 degree days, we might have an early swarming season, but I'm not, not going to talk about it uh, this, this evening. Colony development is tied directly to the progression of flowering plants. Now, the two floral sources that I'm showing up here, crimson clover and tulip poplar, are later in the spring. We are probably right on the edge of having red maple begin blooming, and so the bees should be actively uh, bringing in pollen uh, before long, as long as, as, the, as the weather uh, holds. Uh, I can remember last winter, it seemed as though my bees were bringing in pollen through the entire season. I haven't seen them bringing in any in the last couple of weeks, but up till a couple of weeks ago, they were, they were bringing in uh, pollen. The reason I'm saying that colony development is tied directly to the progression of flowering is whenever you're working with beginners, they always want to know. On what day of the calendar should I do what? All right. Well, we can't we can't say you, you always on uh, February 12th you do this. You need to become a naturalist, so to speak, and to become aware of the plants that are flowering in your particular area, and then make your management schedule in relation uh, to the local floral sources not to a particular day on the calendar. Right now, our main concern is colony survival. And what we're going to do in regards to colony survival, the first thing you need to do is to find the location of the winter cluster. Secondly, the arrangement of the food stores in the hive and the quantity of food that's available to them. I've been feeding all winter. I'm feeding both sugar syrup, which I normally would not recommend this early in the year, but it's, again, the the, uh, the weather's been so mild that the bees seem to be handling it very well, and I've also been fe feeding uh, the sugar cakes uh, by Kent Williams' recipe, which we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. And they are They've been going through a lot of food. And I suspect you may have gone into the fall with adequate food stores, 45, 50 pounds of food. But because it's so mild and the bees have been so active, the food supply may very well be getting short. Normally, we would say February, early March, the bees are walking a tightrope between survival and starvation because you just get a, a cold snap, you get a three, four days of bad weather, they may consume what little food they have left and uh, not make it. So we really need to be concerned about the arrangement of the food stores and the quantity of food that's available to them. We want to build up <clears throat> strong, productive colonies as early as we possibly can to take advantage of early nectar flows and for those of you that suffer some winter losses may want to split those colonies 
and to make up for your winter losses rather than going out and purchasing new bees. All right, let's kind of review what should have been happening over the course of the winter, the so-called winter so far. In the fall, the cluster is going to start out in the bottom of the hive. They're going to slowly eat their way upwards. And again, in a typical year, probably about late October, they will stop raising brood, and then typically early January, they will begin raising brood again. And so this is a, a broodless cluster. Most of the honey by the H is located above that winter cluster. So we're going to start out in the lower part of the hive, and they're going to slowly eat their way upwards. We had such a mild fall, I suspect some of the colonies never stopped brood rearing. Uh, but normally, as we say, the, the queen will have a month and a half or so when she's not laying any eggs. As the winter progresses, the cluster continues to eat its way upward, as we see here. And it doesn't matter how many boxes you have, uh, we expect that winter cluster is going to end up at the top of the hive. And it's still uh, a broodless cluster, but as we said, usually in early January, the queen will begin laying eggs, and John has already indicated he's been in some hives, and he's finding eggs, and larvae, and a little bit of cat uh, brood. Because the brood area is in the uppermost hive body, that means they are locked in to that particular area. And so you need to keep that in mind uh, from, from a management uh, standpoint. Ideally, you can pop the lid if it's 40 degrees or above and just quickly see, are, is the cluster at the very top? That's all you're interested in. You're not going to pull a comb. You're just going to see, is the cluster at the very, very top? And if they are at the very top, that's your signal or that tells you then there's not food above the winter cluster, which can ultimately uh, lead to starvation. If it's above 50 degrees, you might pull one frame and just quickly check for brood. Uh, do not do, plan to do an, a thorough inspection unless it's above uh, 65 degrees. And these are just ballpark temperatures for you to keep in mind in your management uh, program. Colony strength is an important consideration in early spring development of your colonies. It's your strong colonies that are going to build up faster than your weaker colonies. Weak colonies remain weak over long periods of time. And there is a basic relationship between brood and the adult population that ultimately determines the rate in which your colony is going to develop. And so this is why it's important, if at all possible, to have large populations of bees at this time of year as brood rearing is getting underway. As the colony population increases, a smaller proportion of the bees are needed for brood rearing, and that gives you then a larger portion of the field force to go to the field to collect uh, nectar and pollen. And that's the basis, that's the bottom line, so to speak, of our management scheme, is to develop large enough colonies so only a very small proportion of the bees remain house bees in caring for the brood and regulating the temperature. A large colony produces more brood than a small colony, yet has a higher proportion of bees available for gathering nectar and pollen. And this is why your most populous colonies will be your most productive colonies in the spring and early summer, uh, whereas your weak colonies are basically going to remain weak 
over long periods of time. Okay, we said we need to be aware of the arrangement of the food stores and the quantity of the food stores. Now, you may be able to just kind of lift up on the back of the hive a little bit and get a feel. Is there still lots of food or does it seem to be fairly light? The key is to always have food above and to the sides of the winter cluster. Now if you <coughs> pop the inner cover and you see that the cluster is at the very, very top, then you may want to consider feeding some dry sugar or feeding syrup as I, I'm currently doing even though we don't normally recommend feeding syrup uh, this time of year. And the, this is sugar cakes that's produced uh, by Kent Williams recipe. It's dry sugar plus honeybee healthy. And this is the actual recipe if you ha don't have it. 25 pounds of granulated sugar, one quart of apple cider vinegar, three tablespoons of honeybee healthy, and three tablespoons of dry citric acid. Now, when I made up my sugar cakes, I didn't have any honeybee healthy, and so I just used the sugar, and the vinegar, and the citric acid, and the bees have consumed over half of what I produced uh, late in the fall. So, well, honeybee healthy is not absolutely necessary, though supposedly it stimulates their appetite for the sugar, so to speak, and so they will end up consuming more of it. You apply the patty on a newspaper on the top frames and insulate with newspapers and top or put it on cardboard. I said, if you pop the inner cover, and you see the winter cluster at the very top, as you see here, chances are they're going to starve to death. And this happens to be a dead colony. And it doesn't take rocket science to figure out they starve to death because the combs are bone dry. As we said, there should always be food above and to the sides of the winter cluster. Anytime there's less than three full frames of of food or honey, the colony should be fed. As we said, over the next couple of months, this is the critical time between survival and starvation. We lose many more colonies in February and March than we do the whole rest of the winter. And it's because of starvation. We're talking both pollen as well as, as uh, uh, honey. Uh, both are absolutely necessary in colony development. From a survival standpoint, the bees must have the carbohydrate source, the sugar source, whether it be honey, whether it be syrup, or whether it be sugar candy or, or a sugar patty. Survival is associated with sugar. Colony development, brood rearing, is associated with pollen. And you can have lots and lots of pollen present, but if you don't have an adequate supply of carbohydrate, the bees are going to starve to death. But both are absolutely necessary uh, for colony development. Question? Before we get completely away from that feeding that patty, yes, I don't remember one of those uh, honeybee healthy or the citric acid one. One's a tablespoon, one's a teaspoon. Uh, I had both uh, both tablespoons. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I could I'm be wrong, wrong, but I think I copied it down right. Yeah, tablespoons. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think okay, I, that's I, the I, way I. Wrong, I'm not aware that I just copied it. And both are tablespoons. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but like he said, it wouldn't have hurt. Either way. Okay. He just pulled his out and he says it's both of them are tablespoons. Now of course I don't didn't mix up as much as 
that recipe calls for, I, I broke it down and, and <coughs> used the same ratio of all the ingredients. As I said, pollen is essential for the growth of young emerging bees and the development of the brood food glands. Nurse bees care for the brood. Nurse bees feed the brood. In order for their, they have two glands associated with feeding, the hypopharyngeal gland and the mandibular gland. We'll just call them brood food glands, okay? In order for those glands to be active and for them to be effective nurse bees, they have to consume large quantities of pollen. So that means when a new young bee chews her way out of the cell through the cell capping and emerges, within a day or so, she's going to start consuming large quantities of pollen, which ultimately then are going to stimulate the development of her brood food glands. Extended brood rearing is not possible unless pollen or an appropriate source of protein and of vitamins are available. And the vitamins are going to come from the pollen as long, along with many other uh, essential uh, components. But the protein and the vitamins are what are most important from a brood rearing standpoint. If young workers do not consume needed proteins, Brood food glands will not develop completely. Their royal jelly will not support normal growth and development of larvae and will not support egg production in the queen. So having active, effective uh, brood food glands is extremely important. We generally just refer to it as royal jelly, but biochemically, you need to realize that drone jelly, worker jelly, and royal jelly, or I will call it queen, queen jelly, are slightly different in their biochemical composition. Uh, but they have to have effective brood food glands to produce those different types of jellies. If we're going to try to develop strong productive colonies in the spring, we may very well want to consider doing some stimulatory feeding. Not just enough food in order for them to survive, but we're going to try to push them harder, push the queen harder, so to speak, so that they, they are going to develop uh, faster. And we are going to provide them with either a pollen supplement or a pollen substitute. The difference between the two a pollen supplement has probably anywhere from 10 to 15 percent natural pollen. A pollen substitute has no natural pollen whatsoever. And so if you were to do a test and to feed a pollen substitute and a pollen supplement, the odds are they're going to consume a lot more of the supplement than they are the substitute. But this is part of your stimulatory feeding uh, in the spring. I'm going to give you a couple recipes in case you want to trap pollen and freeze it so you'll have it available when you want to do some stimulatory feeding and to use a, a pollen supplement. One pollen cake is two ounces of pollen, five and a half ounces of water, ten and a half ounces of sugar, and six ounces of soybean flour, and that would be expeller processed soybean flour. Uh, the oil can be extracted from the beans either by pressure or chemically. An expeller process is non-chemical, okay, which means it's much better uh, for, for the beans. But any, you can buy a pollen substitute and, and put it in it's just as though it's a soybean flour and, and this recipe will certainly work. You want to make a lot more? Question, yes? Oh, is there a certain time that you need to put the pollen cakes in? Uh, I, I would normally say probably about the first of February in a typical year, whatever typical is. Uh, that, that ballpark anyway. 
Late January, early February. Uh, that's a problem. That's a problem. But we we get a great benefit from stimulatory feeding, and so hopefully the the advantages to the bees are going to outweigh the advantages uh, to the small hive beetle. But the only thing you've got advantages doing it early in the year before the hive beetles start to multiply. Yes. Yes, definitely. That's why I'm saying late January, early February. Yes? Where do you get the soybean flour at? Any bee supply dealer will have it. Okay. Okay, but I would I would just, personally, I would just buy a pollen substitute from a bee supply company. All right, for 32 cakes, 4 pounds of pollen, 11 pounds of water, excuse me, 21 pounds of sugar, and 12 pounds of soybean flour or pollen uh, substitute. So if you're going to trap pollen, this is a tray that's been taken out of a pollen trap. Probably that's about two days worth of pollen if it's in a good part of the, the pollen season. And of course, you need to be concerned. How are you going to get it from the tiny pellets that you see here into a pollen cake? that can be fed uh, to the bees. Here's just another pollen trap, pollen that's been collected. Here's a close-up of what you're seeing. We're going to make pollen soup. You're going to mix the water and the sugar and the pollen together. And then you're going to add the soybean flour or the pollen substitute until it becomes the consistency of something similar to peanut butter, so to speak. And then you're going to make pollen cakes. And in each side of the pollen cake, you're going to put a sheet of wax paper. Now these can be made ahead. These can be frozen. Like you could just take a, a plastic uh, coffee can, make up your pollen cakes, put them in, stack them in there just like you would be stacking uh, uh, pa hamburg patties. Stack them in there and freeze it, and then when you're ready to do your stimulatory feeding, just take out two or three cakes or however many you need, and uh, remove the wax paper from one side and invert it over the top bars, as you see here, and this is a good way to do this stimulatory <coughs> feeding. But as he indicated, we now have a new problem, and that's the small hive beetle. If I, was rearing, if I was rearing small hive beetles in the laboratory for testing, etc., pollen is one of the key components that I would use in the diets of, of the small hive beetle. Is that wax paper on the bottom, on the frame side, or is it on the top side? It's on the top. The bottom, that's right next to the top bars, will, will be no wax paper. You have it there, you just peel one side off and invert it. Okay. And you can just invert your inner cover and put the telescoping cover back on. All right, now here we see an individual that's doing stimulatory feeding, both from the carbohydrate standpoint as well as the protein standpoint. This may very well be uh, a pollen substitute or pollen substitute cakes. And of course, the sugar patty or the sugar patties could very well be. Uh, Kent Williams recipe, or there are many other recipes available <coughs> as well. There are numerous pollen substitutes on the market. I've only listed three of them just to give you examples. Bee Pro is a soy meal based diet. Feed Bee is a non soy based diet. And Mega Bee, which was developed at the Tucson Bee Laboratory, uh, is also um, uh, a soy meal based diet. However, I don't know what all is in it because it's trade secrets and they, they do not publish uh, their complete formula. Uh, here we just see a pollen substitute and you can see how actively the bees are working on it. Let me give you a word of caution. We said we we're going to develop strong populous colonies by, through stimulatory feeding. If you feed both carbohydrates and protein, 
you're going to build up monster colonies. And if you don't stay on top of it, you're going to have one serious swarming problem. So you need to stay on top of it. You just don't go out and throw the food on and say, oh, I'll be back in six weeks. It's going to be too late. <coughs> Mega B may be used as a liquid, a patty, or as a dry uh, feed. Obviously, personally, I believe that either as a patty or as a liquid, they're going to get going to use it much more efficiently than they are with just a dry powder that, that they're collecting. Because then they have to add nectar or honey to it in order to get it to pack, uh, to carry it uh, back to the hive. We put, a, we put a lot of dry on last year and they didn't pay a bit of attention. They didn't pay a bit of attention. Okay. Because they had extra work. Right. That's what I say. I think it's much better to either go with a liquid or patty than here we just see the bees working with it. Uh, in this particular study, mega bee triple brood production increased adult population by 30% over the controls. So as I say, you can create monsters, but you've got to stay on top of it and know what you're doing. All right, unfortunately, you probably are going to come across some dead colonies. And so now I want to talk to you a little bit about Beehive Forensics, or CSI, Beekeeping CSI, okay? <laughs> so it was a crown. <laughs> Why did this colony die? What action should be taken? Can you reuse the equipment? Okay? These are questions you need to ask yourself as you begin to investigate. First of all, what should the colonies look like in the spring? Your weaker colonies may look like this when they're clustered. Uh, this particular one, about two and a half frames of bees. All right, we would say this is a weaker colony in the spring. Here we see where four or five frames are covered with bees. They're still somewhat clustered, but you can see that there's, there's a lot more bees. This is what we need to be looking for. <coughs> We've already said, late in the winter, we're going to expect a patch of brood in the uppermost part of the hives. And we've already stressed the point, there needs to be food above that cluster. Anytime the temperature drops below 57 degrees, the bees begin to form the winter cluster. And the colder it gets, the tighter together that they get. And if you look at a winter cluster in cross section, the outer inch or so of bees of this sphere separated by combs, the outer inch are the insulator bees. And the bees in the center are the heaters. Bees can produce heat, consume honey, and produce heat. You all know what it means to shiver. The honeybees vibrate their thoracic muscles. These are the muscles of the thorax. They, they shiver, they vibrate their muscles, and they generate heat. So the bees produce heat in the center of the cluster, and the bees that are the insulators are trying to conserve the heat that's being produced by the bees on the interior. And that is how the bees survive the winter. The size of the up and expands, they may very well break the cluster as they're doing when it's in 65 or 68 degrees as we've been experiencing. So honeybees have a tremendous ability to regulate temperature. We call it thermal regulation. If there's no brood present during that broodless time, they maintain a temperature of 65 to 70 degrees within that cluster. 
once they start brood production, within that cluster then, they have to maintain a temperature of 93 to 95 degrees. It might be 10 degrees outside of the hive, but in the very center of that cluster, it has to be 93 to 95 degrees. It takes large numbers of bees and lots of honey or fuel in order for the bees to produce the heat that will allow them to survive. And so weak colonies will often die because we may say because of cold temperatures, but it's really due because they don't have enough bees to, to, to produce temperatures of 93 to 95 degrees. Bees die in two days at 45 degrees Fahrenheit or less. So the insulator bees on the outside of the cluster, when they get chilled, they work their way in, and the hot bees in the middle work their way out. And so it's just a constant, slow-moving sphere of bees separated by combs throughout the winter, and that is how they are able to survive. All right, we have a dead colony. We need to try to investigate why did this colony die. Was it due to beekeeper error, starvation, they lost contact with the food supply, queen failure, American fall brew, tracheomites, varroa mites. I listed tracheomites there because Mike Studer at the fall meeting indicated that he was seeing a rise in some tracheomites in certain areas of, of the state. All of these are, are possibilities, and I'm not going to go into all of them tonight because the two that are most critical is starvation and queen failure. Beekeeper error. Did you remove the queen excluders in the fall? They eat their way upwards. If they get to the queen excluder, they keep going up and the queen is left below. And then that gives you a queen of situation. Did you remove frames of foundation in the fall? In order to form that winter cluster, they have to have open cells. Now if you, if not all of the frames are drawn out, part of our fall management would be we would move those frames of foundation to the very outside of the hive body. But where they're going to be in the central part of the hive, be, hive body, they've got to have drawn comb. And so this could interfere with the formation of the winter cluster. Did the colonies have adequate food stores in the fall? We already said there needed to be 45 or 50 pounds of food. Were they light going into the winter? Were the food stores arranged properly? The majority of the food has to be in the uppermost hive body because we said that's where they're ultimately going to end up. And that's where the brood rearing is going to begin. So if you're say, if you're keeping your bees in two full depth hive bodies, what we would like to see is say 35 pounds in the upper hive body and 15 pounds, 10, 15 pounds in, in the lower hive body. The majority of the food has to be at the top of the hive. Colony strength. Were they good strong colonies going into the, into the winter or were they weak? Should you have united some weak colonies together to increase the size of their populations? These are all questions you need to ask as you're trying to figure out why did this colony die? Small winter clusters tend to have higher mortality rates and they're less likely to be able to, to regulate temperature. The most common problem, as we've indicated, and let me say it again, 
is starvation. If you find a cluster of bees, a cluster, in this case, a dead cluster of bees in a compact mass with some dead bees head first in the side, inside the cells, chances are that's a sign of starvation. Now this is the remnants of a dead winter cluster in the spring. Again, it's bone dry. When we talk about head first in the cells, and that's an indication of starvation, this is an excellent example of, of what we're, we're speaking about. If no honey remains in the hive, then most likely <coughs> the colony consumed it all and starved to death. As we've seen here, and I sh showed you that slide a bit earlier. If honey is still in the hive, then the bees probably lost contact with it during cold weather and perished. And this is what we're talking about here. This particular slide was taken when I was a beekeeping specialist in Pennsylvania. We see a dead winter cluster here, and you say, but they still have food. Well, at the time that winter cluster ran out of food within the winter cluster, it was too cold for them to break cluster and to go get food. So they lost contact with their food supply. This is why we recommend that there always be food above and to the sides of the winter cluster. Hopefully the temperature will be warm enough that they can break cluster and go get uh, additional food. You need to check your honey cappings. You've got a dead hive here. If you find cappings with ragged edges, apparently the hive died, and then the honey stores were robbed out by other bees. That gave you the ragged cells, the ragged cappings. But if there's no food, no ragged cappings, then they just literally starve to death. But you look at where those rag cappings are located, and that tells you how much food was left when the colony actually died and then was ultimately uh, robbed out. So the area of this ragged comb indicates the amount of capped honey near the time of the colony's death. If you have all kinds of spotting on the outside of the hive, some places in the north, some beekeepers use auger holes as a means of having extra ventilation. More colonies are lost, especially in the north, are lost due to moisture buildup in the hive than any other reason. And so usually we provide some type of a, uh, an upper entrance or some type of an additional entrance which will stimulate the flow of air through the colony, which will give you a drier interior. I never used auger holes, but what I want you to see here is the spotting on the exterior of the hive. Here's, here's even a worse situation. If you see evidence of this, that tells you then there was too much moisture in their food supply, and they have a bad case of dysentery, okay? And so it was, it was uh, not high quality food. It had too much moisture. And this is what you would get if you, in the north if you were feeding syrup at this time of year because the bees cannot adequately process it down to get it down into around 17% uh, percent moisture. So that just tells you then too much moisture in their food supply. Queen failure results in Small winter clusters. No replacement of old bees as they die off. You may find a partially torn down queen cell. So what does that tell you? The queen died in late summer or early fall. The colony attempted to raise emergency queen cells. They were unsuccessful. Uh, one virgin queen eliminated the other queen cells. If the if the development got to, to that point, uh, the virgin queen failed to mate, and the colony became hopelessly queenless. 
This is just part of what you might see. Here's a partially torn down uh, cell as you see it here. So with queen failure, queenlessness, the bee population decreases and the colony dies out sometime over the course of the winter. You may find a few worker size cells with bullet shaped cappings. That's evidence of a queen problem. Uh, we would say probably in that situation, uh, since cap bullet shaped cappings implies drone brood, that the, uh, you ended up with a drone layer. She could no, no longer lay uh, fertilized eggs. If you have an extremely weak colony with just a few adult bees and brood remaining, you may try to gather some other evidence. <clears throat> Again, I, as I said, I'm not going to take time to, to go in a lot of this, but let me just throw out a couple things. If there's still some brood present, John indicated he was finding eggs and larvae and very few capped cells. The point here is, are those larvae and pupae, are they pearly white in color or are they discolored? Discolored would be an indication of a disease problem or a potential disease problem. Uh, so you're going to just examine, if there's still a small patch of brood present, you're going to examine it and see is it white or is it discolored. I didn't throw a slide in. You're going to look for sunken brood cappings, as you see here. That's an indication of a disease problem. <coughs> Excuse me. When you break this colony down, you're going to expect that there's going to be a lot of dead bees on the bottom board, as you see here. The old bees are going to die off. It's only going to be the young bees that are ultimately going to survive the winter. So this is typical. But if there's disease problems, if there's chalk brood present, then you'll find parts of the mummies uh, in, in this. And so we would also examine these dead bees to look for evidence of varroa mites. And I didn't have time this evening, but I have a slide of a, a dead winter cluster that I took pictures of last year, and I could see dead varroa mites right on the surface of those bees, and I didn't have time to get, pull it out and, and include it. But you're going to be looking for evidence of varroa mites. Check any cat brood cells that remain. Check debris on the bottom board uh, for mites. And for those of you that are not familiar what a varroa mite looks like, that's a female uh, varroa mite. Ideally, as part of your spring management, we would recommend that you scrape the, the bottom boards clean, as you see here, because there might still be some live mites. There may still be chalk brood mummies. There may be other disease uh, organisms associated there. <coughs> so you're going to give the bees a helping hand towards having a healthy condition uh, for their development. You may need to uh, scrape out some uh, bird comb, as you see here. You may want to take out some combs that have a lot of drone uh, size cells on it, as you see here. In other words, you want to cull uh, combs. When I took my first beekeeping class, I think it was in 1966, my major professor, well, he, he was the professor, he ultimately became my major professor, he made the following statement. If you do a good job of nailing your frames together, wiring them, gluing them, a comb ought to last you for 25 years. It may be black in color, but it ought to last for 25 years. Now we say, they ought to be replaced every three to five years, okay? And it's all because of the mites and the, and the diseases and these other pests that, that we're encountering uh, nowadays. So part of your spring management should be culling these, these bad frames. At, at what temperature should we start breaking the hives down like that? As I said, I, I'd like to have it at 70 or above 
and I'm not going to break them for very long at, at 70. Not if, if just if you remember, brood area has to be 93 to 95 degrees. Okay, so you want to be, you want some nice warm temperatures when you do that. Question. So on that picture right there, those ones that sticking out more are the, the drone. Those are drone size cells. Oh, okay. See okay. how much bigger they are. See drones, the cells are deeper, and the diameter is wider. And then they put a bullet-shaped capping. When it's in the pupil stage, you put a bullet-shaped capping on it. Worker size cells are five to the linear inch. Drone size cells are four to the linear inch. So they're they're wider and they're deeper. And so everything that's expanded here outward would be drone size cells. Now, again, that's taken away from a lot of good area in which to produce worker brood. Unless you want to use drone cells as part of your varroa management scheme, as part of your IPM uh, program, then we would recommend that these be culled. And I'm going to stop there. But let me just summarize. What's most critical for you now, not knowing what the weather's going to bring, but uh, my gut feeling is we're going to have some cold spells yet. <laughs> make, <laughs> make sure that they've got adequate food and that the food is above and to the sides of the winter cluster. And right now all you be, should be concerned about is making sure that the winter cluster is not at the very top of the hive. Thank you very much. Okay, I got a question. Okay, so what and how are you feeding right now? What? What and how are you feeding right now? Right now I'm feeding sugar syrup, uh, one and a half to one part, one and a half sugar to one part water. Um, and I'm I'm feeding the sugar cakes. How are you by feeding that? I, I just have a Not piece of sugar cakes, but water. The, the sugar the syrup, how am I feeding it? Yeah. I just have a pint jar with holes punched in, okay. in the lid and just setting it. So I've got a, an empty hive body where the sugar cake is, where the syrup jar is. So I just pop the inner cover and just look in, and I can, in five seconds, determine whether they need to be fed or not. Yes? She's got the King Williams recipe too.